I can't tell you how excited Adriana and I both are that you all have carved out a little time in your incredibly busy schedules to talk to us about hacks because we love the show, we're obsessed with the show, and we actually think the show is about us. Oh, wow. Yeah. It is. Oh, you feel seen. Is. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm an older, I'm sort of, you know, I'm Deborah Vance and <laughs> Adriana is Ava. And we laugh about it all the time. And actually following this podcast, we'd like to talk about a show based on us. Uh, if you all have <laughs> <Sure>. time. <laughs> and, you know, I know you think we're kidding, but we're actually not kidding. Okay, okay great. Love that. Sure. We're open great. for pitches. Let's do it. Well, first of all, I, I also want to say congratulations because it must be an incredible feeling. I know you all have had a lot of success in other shows, and we can talk about those. But I feel like Hacks was has become so huge and has made such a mark. Paul, let me start with you. I mean, what is it like having such a hugely successful show? It must be thrilling, but also kind of a lot of pressure, right? Well, it is a lot of pressure in that I think we've had such a great response and people, you know, who tell us that the show resonates with them. We just want to make it better every season for them. Um, And, you know, as people who love film and television, I love it when a show just gets better and better. And so I think there's pressure in that way. But knowing how much content in the world there is and how much great television there is, it is so gratifying that it's cut through because you never know. You know, we feel very, very lucky that people have found the show and really respond to it. Lucia, what about you? Yeah, very similar sentiment, which is just like, you know, I think especially when people tell us how much the show means to them and how much they feel seen and connect to it or say, you know, like, I watched it with my dad when he was sick and it was something we could laugh at together. And, you know, stories like that, they're so sweet and touching, but also it it, it makes me want to make the show good for those people. And so that is really a huge source of um, (laughs) the uh, almost debilitating uh, anxiety I I feel in general about making the shows. Like, I really just don't want to disappoint people. And I want, like Paul's saying, to give them more of what they they feel like they love about the show, um, but also, you know, still make the show that we want to make. So it is, it's a, it is a lot of pressure, but we, it really comes from having such gratefulness of being able to even make a show right now. Like the industry is in such a weird place of being able to be even writing a season four of a show, which we're doing right now feels like such a rarity. And Jen, bring yeah. it home, Jen. <laughs> no, no pressure. <laughs> No, everything these guys said. And I I think also, you know, just to get to make a comedy right now in 2024, we feel really privileged and lucky. Like we, the three of us, you know, the show is about creative collaboration. It's about two people who are lit up and have a love of comedy. And it's it's what drives them. And, And that's very much so the story of the three of us. We met doing comedy at the UCB in New York and... We love it. And it's Upright really imp- Citizens Brigade Upright for you Citizens neophyte Brigade. listeners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and so to get to do that and make this comedy show with people that I met, like in a sketch group and like a theater underneath a grocery store is like feels really cool and special. And we just I don't know. Yeah, there is there is pressure with it. But you try to just focus on how lucky you are. Are you Canadian, by the way, because you say a boot? <laughs> I know. Okay, so this is so... We talk I'm about glad- it all the time. <laughs> I'm glad we're- so I thought funny. If she's either Canadian or from Baltimore. I'm glad we're getting into this, Katie. So <laughs> I'm from I'm from Boston, and my well, dad what is, is... What the hell is a boot about? <laughs> I know. It's so strange. <laughs> it, it does pop out sometimes. My, what happened... Two things happened, I think. When I went to... I had a, I had a pretty thick Boston accent, because my dad is from South Boston and has, like, a really thick Southie accent. I think when I went to NYU, I kind of lost the accent, but then I did date someone from Canada for quite a long time. And I think I picked up. Started talking like that. I started, I think I picked up some things. So shout out to Brian Bernstein. If you're listening to every piece of media I do, you're still well, in my I'm life sure every day. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm big in Canada, Paul. I believe it, Miss Katie. I believe it. <laughs> Uh, all right. 
<laughs> so, Lucia, I guess you're the best person to bring together the connective tissue. A, Jen was talking a little bit about how you all met, but then also how Hacks is, became a show. Yeah. So, Paul and Jen and I, well, we originally all met when I'm Paul and I met in a level one UCB class. And then Jen and I, maybe two or three years later or something like that, um, met because we were the only girls in a kind of the sketch comedy group, but then the boys stopped emailing us. And so we were kind of <laughs> kicked out of the group. But, um, but Jen and I remained friends. And then I introduced Paul and Jen around that same time. Um, and we were just friends, you know, and then we, I guess the maybe, when is the first time we worked together? Was it on Broad City that, that we actually, well, other than work making the videos? Yeah, that's a good maybe question. It was. It might have been it might have been Broad City I, or maybe I had done punch up for something you guys did. I don't know. Because I, I do feel like we had you took together, their material the and made it funnier, Jen. <laughs> yes. yes. Which is it's a hard to do because they're incredibly funny, mm. uh, the best writers. So I tried at least. I don't know that I succeeded. Um, um she she always does. But yeah, and so we basically we started writing together in different ways. Jen um, punched up a uh, a movie that we made rough night when she she was on set with us, and we we wrote a spec script. The three of us wrote a, a movie that we tried to get um, made that we have yet to succeed in doing. <laughs> um, but then we were writing. Um, Jen and I were kind of helping Paul on his uh, Netflix special. The characters Paul W. Down search that, and. Uh, on our drive from Boston to Portland, Maine, which is where we were shooting a segment for it, we started talking about, you know, women um, in this industry, especially stand-ups, who, like, you kind of only read about when their obituary happens, and you're like, oh, yeah, why didn't they ever have the same kind of careers that their male counterparts had? And we were just kind of talking about this idea of, of what it's like to be a, a woman of a certain age who's had to, you know, try to make it in that industry at a certain time. And then what that does to your personality, what does that do to your psyche, what does it do to your career and how you have to kind of gravitate towards certain kinds of materials to survive. It maybe isn't kind of what you initially intended to do with your comedy, but it's a way to make money. And, and so that kind of is like where we started having this idea. And then the idea of like a younger comedian, a younger woman kind of learning to respect the older comedian through working with her and, and just kind of what that generational conflict would would do. It just felt like a great story engine. It felt like a great character engine. We kind of just never stopped talking about it, um, whether we were hanging out or working together. We just kind of always would email each other ideas of, oh, it could be this idea or that idea. And like, it just kind of over the course of a couple of years from like, I think 2015 until 2019, it was just something we were always working on the on the back burner. And then in 2019, we were like, it really just felt like the right time to pitch it. And, and it took you five years, as you said, from kind of the conception to getting it ready to pitch. And you were all busy doing other things. I know, Jen, you were on The Good Place, right? Mm -hmm. And yep. weren't yep. you guys also working on Broad City? Lucia mm -hmm. and Paul, as Lucia mm -hmm. mentioned, you both had plenty of other projects. But this thing was just sort of this nagging idea that wouldn't go away. And I want to talk about the characters and, and who they're based on in a minute. But if you if you will indulge me for a moment, I'm sort of interested in all of your origin stories because I love to know kind of why people become what they become. And I know, Paul, you grew up in New Jersey. You were yep. kind of a weird, you describe yourself as kind of a weird, quiet, shy kid. And you had <laughs> parents who were super funny and you kind of related you loved, I think you said that the comedy kind of fueled you and it also made you less lonely. It made you connect with people. See, I did my research. Paul. Yes, I know. <laughs> can, can you talk a little bit about that and how yeah. ultimately you decided to pursue this as a career? Yeah, I mean, you know, I was I certainly actually wasn't shy is the truth, but I was very eccentric and strange as a child, I think. Um, and my parents certainly fanned the flames of that. They, you know, my mom and I used to watch Nick at Night and we watched I Love Lucy and Bewitched and, um, you know, whatever else was on. And my dad was a big fan of the Marx Brothers and um, Mel Brooks. And, you know, so I was watching Young Frankenstein probably before I even understood what half of the references were. Right. Um, and yeah, it was the thing as a kid that, you know, I think a lot of people get into comedy because it's, 
you know, the thing that, especially when you share a sense of humor with somebody, you find your people. Um, and certainly for me, it was also a way of, um, you know, you, you can avoid being bullied if you can make people laugh. So that was certainly, a, it, was a, it was a defense mechanism in a way too. And, uh, and yeah, I just always loved it. And I loved Saturday Night Live and I loved watching Robin Williams and I just wanted to do what he and those people did. So I started writing for myself. In high school, I would do character monologues because I went to a, a school that had a great performing arts program and there was this thing called the Black Box Theater. And at lunchtime, you would do like, lunchroom performances like a coffee shop for, <laughs> really? for the kids who weren't sitting at the popular table you could go and do like coffee shop poetry or <laughs> character monologues oh i love your school i'm so glad they did that yeah the pingree school shout out to al romano and patricia wheeler <laughs> who were running the program there at the pingree school um but yeah it was like a performance at arts high school and um i think that certainly started me off and then when i uh went to college i did improv and sketch in college. And so when I moved to New York after I was doing stand up and I was auditioning for things and I wanted to be a comedic actor, but it wasn't until I started doing improv again. And actually it was day one <laughs> of our first improv class that I met Lucia. Um, and I, I told them this recently, it's so weird. Maybe it's just because you know someone's going to be important in your, in your life, but I remember the moment of meeting both Jen and Lucia. And I don't have that for many people in my life which is pretty wild. What do you remember? Well, I showed up early to class because I was so nervous. And <laughs> Lucia came about 10 or 15 minutes late, very nonplussed and said, what are we doing? And I was like, who is this girl who's so confident and walked in and was like, essentially, and then very shortly thereafter, I was doing a scene in this class and she did turn to the instructor and, and said, you should write that line down, which is not something you do in improv, but she was already directing in a way. Oh, that's funny. And then mm. I, I knew of Jen because I had read some of the sketches that Lucia and Jen were writing. And for Lucia to be lit up by somebody meant they were very special. And I know Lucia spoke so fondly of Jen and how funny she was. So I was very excited to meet her. And then I met her at a coffee shop and I was struck by, well, I did say, wow. Funny and beautiful, which is probably very inappropriate. <laughs> Nowadays, it's like, I, I couldn't do it. But it was interesting because it was in front of your girlfriend at the time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not the kind jealous of guy type. I am. No. You know? yeah. I'm like, I said, we you know what? He's totally right. I agree. That, and that's an exclusive, Miss Katie. Okay, that's I'm talking about that in yeah. other, in other venues. Yeah, breaking uh, news. Oh um, such an old-timey line to kind of do also at like, what were you, 24? Or 25. I, uh, truly, am I Groucho Marx speaking of? Yeah, I, I, I yeah. could have done the Harpo putting my leg in her hand when I shook her hand. But, you know what I mean? It was that kind of a thing. It was very old school vaudevillian almost. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But Jen, yeah, so... I... Um... Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. This plus one thing's a little harder than it looks, you guys. No, um, it's plus three on this no, end. No, and, 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 and Atron, to just jump in whenever you want. The other thing, too, that I'm realizing is I'm so used to having to be silent on call, like when I'm producing it, but I guess I can laugh, too. Um, Jen, I, know. <laughs> I can laugh. I know you're very deadpan. Adrian is really funny and fun. Are you a little nervous, Adriana? I'm not nervous. I just, you're driving. I'm not used to having to be in the passenger seat and also speaking. Okay, mm -hmm. well, let, you know, come on, make it happen, girl. Okay. <laughs> so, Jen, I know that you yes. really like the Mary Tyler Moore show and that... Yes. Um, Want, was part of the reason you wanted to become a TV writer. What was it about that show that drew you to the industry? Yeah, I was like, a, like I was an only child and my parents weren't around a lot. I, I watched a lot of Nick at Night, like old it TV. It seems like this is, a, this is some connective tissue, Nick at yeah, Night. Lucia, I know, were you I a know. big Nick at Night person? I I watched it. <laughs> this is like there, Naked Night I, Anonymous. I think, she was I think cooler. I were more, yeah. She, yeah. Cooler. she is cooler. I mean, that is true. I don't know. But um, were you watching the Mary Tyler Moore show on Nick at Night? Because, by the way, Jen, you and I are kind of on the same page because I became a journalist because of the Mary of Tyler course. Moore oh my show. Gosh, yeah. And yeah. absolutely love that show. And I thought it was so interesting when I read that you thought the pilot was the perfect pilot. And yeah. then it made me, I've rewatched uh, the Mary Taylor Moore show on YouTube or on whatever. Yeah, I guess on YouTube. And 
Can you remember, do you remember exactly what was in the pilot? Is that when Lou Grant said you have spunk and I yeah, hate spunk? Yeah. So, so the pilot to me, that is exactly it. During the interview when Lou and Mary meet for the first time, it is that, you know, a meet, I think the reason it's such a good pilot is like that in that interview scene, their rapport and their comedic games are so evident right immediately. And you immediately are like, oh, I want 100 more episodes of these two doing this. And so I thought about that scene a lot during the Deborah and Ava interview scene in our pilot because it kind of had the same exact feeling, which was you need to buy into the dynamic between these characters immediately for it to work. And, you know, Mary, they have such crazy good chemistry in that scene. It's so funny. And then the other reason I think it's the perfect pilot and it did influence me wanting to be a TV sitcom writer is for me, like sitcoms are so special and wonderful when they are both really funny, but have heart and make you feel things even in 30 minutes, 21 minutes on network. And that pilot is so funny, but it also is so heart wrenching at the end when her, you know, ex comes back and she's moved and she's like kind of kind of been longing for him and he comes back in her life and she's finally realized her value and it's just like a two-line thing but when he says like take care mary and she goes i take care of yourself mary and she goes i think i just did that like made me choke up that made me choke up as like a 10 year old (laughs) and i was like (laughs) Oh, this is so funny and also so real and emotional that those are the stories I want to tell and what I want to do. So, yeah, it was it was incredibly influential to me. And Lucia, what about you? Because then I want to ask Jen about waitressing, because I thought that was so interesting too. your experience as a waitress for all those struggling actors and comedy writers out there who are waiting tables. That can be quite an education. But I'll, I but I first want to ask Lucia, like, what I is think your that was, back- my, that was the that was me, actually. Oh, that was that Lucia. is Lucia. <laughs> oh, sorry. I mean, the yeah. article that you read, I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Jen did also. Jen worked at a Jen I, I worked was, at did, shop. Lucia, to be was honest, it, we all have dip? service yeah. industry. We all oh, work yeah, at we restaurants. All tables. Yeah. Really? And Lucia, right. wait, Lucia, did you work at Koi? I did. Okay, I so at Koi oh, at well, the let, me do, let me do a, a more seamless trans, transition okay. here. Okay. Because, okay. Um, Lucia, I know that you didn't get into a school you wanted to get into, and you ended up waitressing at a restaurant called Koi. Um, yes. Tell me, and, and even before that, tell me what drove you to this this line of work? Yeah. I mean, I, um, oh, I actually kind of, my, what I really wanted to do when I was younger was be, um, an MTV VJ. That was like <laughs> what I wanted to do. I was like, that just, you wanted right. to be Martha Quinn. <laughs> yes. I literally did. I was like, that's right. I'm going to hang out with rock stars and just kind of hang out and get famous doing it. That <laughs> and she would have right. been perfect doing that. You would <laughs> have been great. so well yeah, suited. Yeah. Lucia has amazing did, music taste. So that's very sweet. Um, but uh, that didn't work out. So then, you know, I also loved comedy. I loved watching, you know, SNL and I was obsessed with The Simpsons and Daria was really influential to me as a, as a kid. Um, and but but then when I went to college and um, my undergrad, I I did go. I went to Columbia and I was and I loved the film studies program there. But I didn't get into grad school. I wanted to go to NYU Film School and I didn't get in. Um, and so take that NYU Film School. <laughs> <laughs> so I started I started doing improv classes because I knew I literally like Googled Amy Poehler. I was like, what is she? How did she get to? Because she, it was a time where Tina and Amy were the. Uh, Weekend Update hosts. And um, then that led me to UCB. And so I moved back to New York um, after college. I like took the summer off. And then um, that's where I met Paul. But I I kind of, you know, I'd studied film studies. And so I I wasn't really planning on being a director necessarily, um, even though like, you know, I had now seen so many films as an undergrad that it was really, you know, I, I had a certain language t- to discuss it. And I actually thought maybe I would go into criticism because I, I had a um, professor there, Andrew Sarris, who I really um, learned a lot from and loved. But um, then, then when we started, you know, like performing and doing improv and sketches and all that, I did start to gravitate towards um, the directing. But part of what I felt like was a great education for directing was waitressing. And yes, I worked at a couple restaurants in New York, but the, the tenure, my longest tenure was at Koi, <laughs> which is at the Bryant Park Hotel. Um, I love their 40th. crispy rice with the oh. tuna. <laughs> Yum. It's fantastic. And, and I have to say, they're like the OGs of that. I don't remember having it before or seeing it now. It's kind of everywhere, but let's give um, it up oh, to had, Koi. 
I know. <laughs> Come on, Koi. Thank Koi. you for that crispy you, rice. <laughs> and I'll say I've gone back since not working there, and the food was good then, and it's still good now. I don't know why this is now a commercial for a restaurant, but um, <laughs> go but to Koi up... at Koi.com. <laughs> <laughs> but I also grew up in the restaurant business. My parents owned restaurants, and my dad was a chef, and my mom um, designed the it was a pastry chef. And also they ran the restaurant together. So I also grew up um, with like a husband and wife in front of me working together as Paul and I do now. And, and where I also, was that again, Lucia? This was in Amherst, Massachusetts. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yes. So my are, you the own... one that's, are you the one that's behind the Papa Gino's Bertucci's joke? Actually, no, because I would never go to another pizza place. Like, I would so that, never go to yeah. those places. So that's Jen. <laughs> that's that's Jen. me. That's me. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, Lucia wouldn't be caught dead in uh, Papa Gino's. But... I'm Papa Gino's family, so oh, I'm thank Papa you Gino's for your service. family also, yeah. 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 I'm um, not. I'm at my own family, literally. <laughs> <laughs> You're an Agnello family. Yeah, yeah I'm an Agnello. Um, so, but, but I definitely felt like, you know, working as a waitress was such a great education for show running and directing because you deal with front of house, back of house, you know, which is very much like dealing with networks and executives and, you know, actors. And then also back of the house, which is also kind of actors, but like crew people and, you know, learning the nuts and bolts of what goes into it and having to kind of ship, shift, shape shift, um, depending on who you were dealing with. And like, do I need to just be brief here and just get it done? Or do I go over here and, you know, do they want to show or whatever it is? It's like everybody needs something different and you need it all to decide immediately. And also things are moving a hundred miles per hour and you get in the weeds in both scenarios where you're like, oh my God, I have so much right now. How am I going to get through this? And it's just one foot in front of the other and putting out fires. And, and so I really actually feel that waitressing was like the most incredible education I could have asked for it. And maybe you could, God, Lucia, maybe go. you could do a show about a restaurant, maybe based in <laughs> Chicago, <laughs> where behind you, chef, and all your experiences at Koi. You know what's so funny is that, okay, so now I can't do that show because of the bear. Great show. Um, but also, you know, the other thing that I'm very passionate about is soccer. And I can't do oh, that yeah. either because of Ted Lasso. So I'm like, I don't everybody's... know. What about a female <laughs> soccer story? I feel like they, they, they can't have the corner on, uh, on the market on <laughs> on soccer. I mean, I don't know. It seems like people have short memories, too, which is something you were worried about because you guys had a big. Do you like that seamless transition? That was good. We are, I don't know where it's going yet, but I'm loving it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Loving it. Because you guys had to take a big break because oh, yeah. Gene had some medical issues and then you had the writer strike. And mm. I know you were concerned that viewers weren't going to stay with you or they were going to move on. But I think nobody moved on. I was so excited. And Adriana, we were so excited <laughs> so when excited. the third season came came on. Weren't weren't we, Adrian? We were so weird. So weird. <laughs> we were like cracking up in the theater at South by Southwest, like to an, <laughs> a strange degree. Oh, that's oh, great. That's so Thank that you. was such so a nice. fun screening. That was really it fun. It was so fun. We were so happy you guys were able to come. Well, we're we're your biggest fans, as I said. Adriana, do you wanna do you want to talk about like the characters and who they're based on a sure. little bit? Sure. Um, so I know you guys have said that Deborah is really an amalgamation of a lot of female comedians. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about building out her character and what you might have pulled from who? That was sort of the biggest uh, challenge in getting the show ready to pitch was creating this history of this like iconic stand up. And yeah, basically in our history of the character, she started doing a husband and wife live comedy act, kind of like Nichols and May, um, Mike Nichols and Elaine May. And they had a very public and messy divorce, not unlike Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. Um, she was, you know, um, maligned by managers. And we read um, Debbie Reynolds's autobiography. And um, there's obviously a lot of Joan Rivers. She has her stand-up life, but also her QVC life. Um, and then there's, you know, there's other stand-ups like Paula Poundstone and Phyllis Diller. And she's sort of an amalgamation of a lot of different women who, um, you know, suffered indignity after indignity, especially in the industry of comedy. Um, and, and Ava is much more someone, you know, from sort of our generation, though younger than us now, um, who came up, you know, through a more traditional comedy writing um, path, although she was plucked off of Twitter, as Deborah says in the pilot. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, both of them are are 
characters that exist in our minds in the world of comedy? As someone who was an assistant, um, I can't imagine writing Ava's character without um, have, having some lived experience of being an assistant or a writer's assistant. Um, Jen, is how much of Ava is based on the early days of your <laughs> career? I mean, Ava Ava's very much, her experience as a comedy writer is very much an amalgamation of all three of ours, um, you know, having come up doing comedy. I mean, I was... I was a assistant um, to difficult people at times. And so, yeah, there's there's a little bit of that in there. Um, but I think, you know, the thing that Ava has at the beginning that hopefully none of us had is like all three of us, like like we said, waitressing, working in service industry, like kind of pounding the pavement, doing comedy like we didn't. I guess I maybe I did get my first paid writing job at 25, which is really young. But Ava is even more of like didn't have to pay her dues at all. Like she kind of in our backstory for her, like got this job off of Twitter and didn't even finish college. Um, So in a way, like, yeah, we she didn't have that until she meets Deborah, of course. And then she goes through the hazing process of working for Deborah Vance in season one and beyond. Um, Never quite had anything as as rough as the (laughs) Deborah Ava dynamic, though, thankfully. Not yet. I, anyway, I want to ask you guys about about Hannah because she's got a really interesting background too, and I know that you all marvel at her acting chops, how committed she is, and also what a great person she is. I'd love to hear more about that because we always hear when people are creeps and not when they're really nice, right? <laughs> but right. Um, you know, she's got a, an interesting sort of family history in comedy. And uh, just tell us a little bit about picking her for the role. And were there a lot of people who auditioned? And I know you can't tell us who auditioned and who didn't get the role, although the stories <laughs> are always so fascinating. But t- but tell us a little bit about selecting her for the role of Hannah. I think I like looked at all the casting tape submissions we had gotten because we only, you know, we started doing readings for her in person and then COVID happened. And so then everything switched to virtual. And I think at one point I tallied up and we saw almost 500 audition tapes for Ava. Oh, my gosh. Um, were they yeah. mostly well-known people or were they mostly... No, it was- it was an it was a combination. There was some definitely well known people, and then of course a lot of people who like Hannah had not really done much, or people who had just been working were working actors. You know, we always in the conception of the show when we talked about casting, we didn't lock ourselves into anything, but we always felt that it was Jean and she'd be incredible, and like you know that it would be a known performer for Deborah, and then the dream was to find kind of a newer discovery for Ava. Um, so we were really open to getting tapes from anyone and everyone. Um, and we watched all of those and, and Hannah really in her first tape and every moment after that, every callback and to the test with Jean, she just really surprised us. And, you know, you, you, the thing about it being a writer is you, when you audition people, you hear your writing and you're seeing mm. over and over and over. And right. I will just speak for myself. I was like, I can't hear this scene anymore. It's not good. This doesn't work. Mm-hmm. You know, like when people, you know, we were lucky we had really wonderful people audition, but no, like, you know, you just sometimes are like, it's not that, it's not that. And it's so specific. And when Hannah did it, she just brought something so unique and new to it. Um but also familiar to us because we had been living with this character for so long and we knew who Ava was and who she was supposed to be. So to get that combination of someone delivering on what you'd envision, but also bringing, you know, newness and freshness and like, oh, I never imagined that line that way, but that works. That's mm-hmm. what it should be. Like she really had that in spades. And it's so interesting that her mom is Lorraine Newman from SNL. And, I know. you know, that was that was kind of exciting was she was she pretty much just writing and not acting was this I I know because I think I read Paul that you said it's just su- such a shock that that she had never acted before really oh crazy in fact I remember when Jean found out and she was like what because some <laughs> people just have something that Hannah has which is it is an innate she has a gift for you know she is just so natural and so watchable and also she's able especially in this season 
to become so authentically emotional. You know, she's not, she's never acting at something. She is feeling these feelings of the character. She is so in the character. And part of it, I think, because she comes from a family that valued comedy and worshipped comedy. Like, I think she has the same kind of reverence for comedy that Ava has. So she really feels the character. And for us, you know, we had Jean attached and she's a national treasure. So part of the reason for the extensive search was you want someone who can go toe to toe with Jean. And if you're getting someone who's lesser known, that's a very tall task. And also, you know, we, um, we really wanted somebody that earned the role. And so actually when we Googled Hannah. The only thing we could find was she had done Colbert, which is ironic and very full circle since yeah. doing doing late night is very much the white whale for our main character. So she had done some stand up and she is a stand up. Um, but that was about it. And then we also discovered who her mom was and that her mom was Lorraine Newman, who all of us were fans of. But we also were like, oh no, I hope. I hope people don't have the the misconception that she got her foot in the door because, you know, we had no idea when she auditioned who she was, much less who her mother was. You know what I mean? So it was a really interesting thing that I think it it gives her so much to draw from in her actual life mm -hmm. in terms of what women in comedy have gone through and in terms of like what comedy means to people. But um, for us, we never, we didn't ever want that to precede her because she is so, so good. And she is, she's always like, well, I'm a, com I'm a comedian. I come from comedy. And we're like, sure, you're a comedian, but you are a gifted actress. You are an actress. And Capital I guess a. she's been she's been nominated for Emmys, but hasn't won one yet. And I think this is going to be her year, kids. Hey. <laughs> I, hope so. hey. I hope so. We do and too. She, you know, you you say Jean Smart is a national treasure, and honestly, you know, as somebody who was a big fan of hers, who watched Designing Women, mm -hmm. um, you know, I feel like she hasn't had a, a platform like des since Designing Women to really show her incredible skills and just how funny she is. Um, you know, did that, was, a nat was that a natural thing going to Jean Smart? And I love what Adriana was mentioning about this amalgamation of, of comedians, because, mm -hmm. you know, these are kind of my generation, like Elaine Boozler. Like, when was the yeah. last time you heard that name? And Paula Poundstone and all these women who, you're right, it was so, it must have been so hard for them back in the day. But was Jean Smart just a just an immediate thought from you all? Or how did you come up with with her as the lead? It was a well, very short, very it was a sorry. very short list. Go I'm ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry, Lucia. My phone just dropped. Go ahead. Oh, OK. Yeah, it was a very short list. You know, and Jean was very much at the top of that list. And I think the thing we were searching for was somebody obviously who could be a believable stand up because if if you don't believe this woman is a stand up and like kind of this iconic diva then the whole thing falls apart you're like eh but <laughs> we knew that we wanted to write towards some more dramatic elements and to be able to find somebody who could do comedy and believably be a stand up but also can do serious dramatic work and it has, has a resume that shows that it was really hard there's some people that were like oh that person's so funny but can they do drama they've never really done it do they want to do it is that going to be a stretch but but Jean was really the perfect person for us because not only can she do comedy and drama in equal measure but there's something about also her her stature her aura that just gives like this fabulous twist to it as well and feels like this you know it's partly because she's a tall, gorgeous blonde, but there's just <laughs> something about how she has a command and she's, mm -hmm. she just draws your eye. And it just felt like that is what you kind of need to believe that this is a woman whose entire ecosystem circle circles her. And you know what, not to diminish her prolific career because she's been working honestly nonstop. She works so much, but she was always one of our favorite things when we would see Frasier. She stood out in that show so much. And, you know, when she did the Brady Bunch movie, she plays like a really scene-stealing person in that movie. And it's crazy to think that she very much embodies Deborah because even though Jean has worked forever and is beloved, she'd never been number one on the call sheet. She had never had yeah. a lead that could show her range. So it was sort of like, oh, here's someone who maybe hasn't had their due to show the world everything that she can do. And so in that way, she very much was Deborah Vance. And she's, um, I think she's 73, Jean. And you mean, she is. Don't ask is, me. I mean, she's, <laughs> she is so gorgeous. I yes, met her at, 
gosh, I think I went to a Vanity Fair party for the Oscars. I know I'm very cool. (laughs) (laughs) And um, we were walking out at the same time. First of all, she's so lovely and I've interviewed her before. But that lady is one tall drink of water. Good Lord. She looks amazing. And yes. she's just so gorgeous. And, um, you know, I think she's so fantastic in the role. I got a cough. Hold on. Go. I took a sip of my diet ginger ale and it went down the wrong pipe somehow. Mm. Go oh. ahead, Foss. I was just going to say, when we met Jean and Hannah and all of you at South by Southwest, Jean was presenting Hannah with a, an award and... It, their relationship in real life just seems so authentic and so sweet. Um, did they did their chemistry? Was it obvious just from the first table read? It was actually from the audition, I would yeah. say. Yeah. It was just like a, a immediate, even just the way that they like, you know, there's something also about their gender expression that also mm-hmm. just felt like the right thing where, you know, Deborah's, I mean, Jean is just kind of this like statuesque, you know, female ideal and hannah also so beautiful but like has kind you know she she showed up in the doc martens and the jeans and it was just (laughs) kind of like she's got a bit of grunge going yeah yeah just something about just the way that they looked together that just felt right and it's true that like their relationship mirrored that like and they've really been there for each other through a lot of hard hard moments we've had some um you know really sad Things happen. Um, I know, Jean. I mean, I was going to mention because I talked to Jean about this, and I think, you know, she was very generous about talking to me because I lost my husband a number of years ago, but she lost her husband of of thirty five years. I know in March of twenty twenty one, and, um, you know, gosh, I guess work at least for me it was really invaluable for me because you could compartmentalize and focus on something other than your sadness. But that must have been a tough period for for her and for you all for her, right? Oh, yeah. We, we, we've we all, ve- I mean, th- and this is overused, this term, but we really have become family. You know, you, you become that when you're together with people for so long in so many places, and especially when you've been through things like that. And I think... You know, it happened during shooting. It was like the last couple of weeks of season one. And um, I know that Hannah was really there for her. Um, and Caitlin Olson, who plays her daughter on the show, was really there for her. Um, you know, Jean has uh, now a 13-year-old um, and she has two children. But it was really, it was a very hard time. But Jean, I think she wanted to finish the show and come back and have, you know, she didn't want the crew to be out of work. She was like, let's finish. And I think it was nice for her to be back together with this little family. Um, but yeah, it was, it, it's been kind of crazy. The things that have happened, a lot of life has happened behind the scenes. I wanted Paul, to ask you all, <clears throat> sorry, Foz, you want to ask something? Well, I, I was going to, but go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, I was going to ask Paul about um, Meg Stalter because she's <laughs> your counterpart on the show. And I love, love her. Meg Stalter. A- Adriana and I, Love me. I mean, we love everyone on the show. Paul, we also love you on the show. Well, thank you very so much. much. So. <laughs> yeah, we think you're great and so funny. But but thank you. Meg is so funny. Yeah. And that first season, especially just so annoying and so <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> and, and I felt for you having having her work for you. Um, yeah. Tell us about her because she kind of came came out of nowhere, didn't she? I mean, she's another one who this was her first like television job. You know, she had been doing live comedy and she is like she comes from the alt comedy scene where the three of us met and was doing like Instagram videos, really. Um, We had we had written this character and we're basing it on like, again, this character was also weirdly an amalgamation of people we have known. But Meg in her character work on Instagram did this thing of having like bravado, but also kind of a weird kind of stuttery way of speaking and a nervousness that weirdly like was exactly what we wanted. And then I did a stand up show that she was on and she was, I had never seen anything like it. It was to call it stand up is, um, unfair <laughs> honestly <laughs> because it's performance art it's performance art like she you know you, you like write a set and you hone a set and she came in she's like 
okay, um, hello, everybody. Oh, that's my daughter right there. Please be nice to my daughter. Like, it was just so like <laughs> stream of consciousness bizarre. She's like, I'm going to show you how to enter a party and make a scene. I, I, I can't even Every, describe it. If you get a chance to see her perform, you guys have to, because it's like her live is incredible. I've never seen yeah. someone so connected with the audience, but like off book. And like, like she, you're chaotic. just like, yeah. chaotic, chaotic, but it's she's like very she's easy. in control because it works she, and everyone's laughing. It's she's so, so free. I think that's the thing. She's so yeah. free. And that's like the, a great thing to have in a scene partner because it allows you to be free too. You have to be because there's just like, uh, it's just a, an electric thing. And we have a lot of fun, sometimes too much fun. Lucia might, <laughs> might attest to the fact that sometimes she's like, guys, <laughs> uh, rain it in. Get back to the story, please. <laughs> but we make each other laugh, you know, like she was, um, she and I both had a mutual affection for each other. Um, and that night we met, we were able to tell one another and it was really like, even though she did audition for the role and even in her audition, she was like, I've, she was remember she had like a lamp on the floor. She was like, yeah, it was like an yeah. interrogation room. There was like one bulb on a thing, and she's like, I thought this would look good. Sorry, <laughs> it became like a performance piece. Just getting her to start yeah. the audition over Zoom. So there's no one like. Meg well, Salter. I was going to say this is probably one of the best things that ever happened to her uh, to to be in the show because she's just exploded as a result. I want to be mindful of your time, but I wanted to ask just, you know, ask you a couple quick questions about the logistics of making the show, because mm -hmm. I I've never really been in a writer's room. I think I told you all my daughter, Ellie, writes for this show called The Boys on oh, Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, think cool. I, I think I mentioned that on at South yes. by Southwest and I kind of understand what it's like. But, you know, when you sit down and you're kind of talking about what is going to transpire in each episode, is it the three of you kind of just riffing? Do you all, I mean, and are there a lot of other writers in the room? Can you just kind of give us a sense of how something goes from an idea to an actual episode? Yeah. Um, so at the beginning, it's like the three of us really kind of hone in on what we, you know, there's a tremendous amount of material that we built up while we were developing the show and when we pitched it. I think we've said this many times, but we, you know, when we pitched the show, we pitched the very last scene of the series. So we know very much have a roadmap of where we want to go for each season and for the characters. And so three of us, you know, we talk um, before a season of like what we uh, big picture ideas and what the tent poles are. And, you know, we do like blue sky, big picture can kind of be anything. And then we'll have, you know, sometimes we'll have a few outlines even written or, you know, things like that before the writer's room starts. Because, you know, the thing with the show, it's like such a we're very lucky to keep making it, but it's like by the time we finish post on one season, we're doing press for that season coming out. And then by the time you know it, like the press hasn't ended, but we're starting writing the next season. Um, and so it's kind of just like this constant train that's always on the tracks and moving. And so, you know, we talked. That stressed me out. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a, it's, a, it's a party train. It's a fun train. <laughs> it's yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, but nonstop. Nonetheless. But not, but nonstop. Yeah. And so, you know, then the writer's room will we have a wonderful group of writers who, you know, pretty much all of them have been us, been with us since season one. Um, and they come in and we, you know, the breaking of an episode is you talk big picture. You say, OK, here are the tent poles of the season. We know, for example, in season three, we know we're building to Deborah getting the show and then taking the job away from Ava and then blackmail. But so then when you start getting more granular, it's like, OK, the premiere episode. Uh, Deborah and Ava, they've been a part. We know we're going to do a time jump. They have to come back together. Where are they coming back together? Like just kind of big idea, pit like pitches on what that can be. Then you hone in on stuff. And once you hone in on stuff, and I'm getting very granular and specific, but maybe it's interesting. You start writing it, it down. You start writing it down on cards, which is kind of breaking of an episode, which is each index card is a scene. Um, and just saying like, okay, Deborah and Ava meet in the elevator. They have an awkward interaction where Deborah is kind of cold to her and Ava is taken aback by it. Um, and, and you just do that for a full episode, um, until you have all the scenes broken and you feel good about the beats of the story and the turns and the character development and the resolution. And then once, you know, we've all decided that that works, someone goes off and outlines it 
comes back, the three of us, you know, we pretty we rewrite and or just like not, not rewrite, but we have our hands on every part of the process. So we go through it, make tweaks, uh, and then someone goes off and and writes the episode. Um, and so, yeah, we usually the three of us write a half or so of the episodes, maybe a little less of the season. And then our writers write the others. But it's such a TV writing. The thing I love about it is it's like such a collaborative process that like sometimes when people would be like, you know, I would when I was a staff writer in Parks and Rec or Good Place, they'd be like, oh, you wrote that episode. I could tell you wrote that episode. And I'm like, everyone. Right. You know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. it's it's which is what's so wonderful about it. And like so, so fun is that it's really collaborative. And Lucia, um, do you all have you all directed? Directed episodes. I know, Lucia, you have done a number of episodes, right? I mean, I, I should know this. I apologize. But tell no, me about fine. directing. I direct most of them. Um, Paul has also done, I think you've done, has it been two each season? Mm -hmm. Yes. So Paul has directed at least yeah, two each season. And we've had a couple guests come and do one or two episodes a season. Um, but but I usually do what a six or so at a season mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that, of the eight or nine or ten and jen don't um, you want di don't you want to direct <laughs> <laughs> you know i get i get this question a lot i i've been really spoiled by my creative collaboration with two phenomenal directors because i'm not i'm not lacking in um feeling the show is in very good hands but if i want the show to start going downhill i definitely will direct <laughs> we, always do, we, we always say we want her to direct but you know, we, we can't force her. <laughs> like, I, I, you know, you say the show going down to hill and I, you know, it, it, it must be sort of when I said earlier on about, you know, it's both exhilarating, but a lot of pressure, you know, these characters do have to evolve and new things have to happen and you all have to come up with new storylines. And mm -hmm. I think season three was really, I, I, I found it, um, more dramatic in some ways than comedic, although, of course, there's there's so many comedic moments. Um, but you really started to understand Deborah's journey. I hate the word journey. <laughs> Don't you hate the word journey? Like, we need to strip that from the lexicon because it just is so overused. My breast cancer journey. Deborah's journey. Anyway, um, but, but um, you know, uh, tell me about kind of what went into that and 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 where you go from here obviously mm. you go from she got the late night talk show right and that i can't imagine doesn't provide just endless storylines and fun things about staffing and you know and all sorts of stuff right you can introduce yeah. all kinds of characters um but but can you just talk about sort of the evolution of her character and where you see the show going in season four. Have you guys, are you starting to, wait, when does season four come out? In Next spring. spring. Next, Next spring. spring. But so are you starting to shoot in September? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're um, writing it so, now. We're about halfway through. Well, a little bit more than halfway through writing season four. So can four. you just, I mean, I know that's sort of the longest question ever asked, but mm -hmm. kind of give us a sense of season three and now how it's going to, to go into season four. And and I mean, obviously, I know you can't give stuff away. And of course, we have to talk about that very important scene in season three when J. Smith Cameron um, has that encounter with, <laughs> with Deborah and a certain <laughs> television journalist's name <laughs> is mentioned, uh, which was very exciting. You all told me when I saw you at South by Southwest, frankly, I thought I deserved a little more airtime. I agree. I, I, <laughs> I know. That, did we build it I, up? I did we that. build it up? I think we did build it up. You did we build like, it up. I was uh, like, that's it? Well, I'm I couldn't kidding. believe I'm kidding. Sorry, I'm kidding. sorry. I couldn't but believe we it wasn't kidding. That. It we was a reference to Sarah Palin, I believe. But anyway, but first, first answer that initial question, if you could, about season three and then moving into four. Yeah, we always knew season three was going to be her Deborah's quest to get this late night job, which was opening up. And, you know, the idea of late night, obviously late night is such like an institution in the comedy world. And it was the thing that you... Like, I think that for stand-ups, it was like the marquee job, the thing that they all wanted to do. And if you were a stand-up, it was the, the show you wanted to be on because it could make your career. And so we always wanted to build to this season 
But now that we're in season three and you understand the characters more and you get to see, you know, I think a different gear for each of them. So we got to get underneath the characters. We get to meet Deborah's sister, which was obviously a point of trauma for her since her husband left her for her sister. We got to get some more, you know, heartfelt moments from Jimmy and Kayla because now we've been with them. And while they are the comedic duo and oftentimes comedic relief, it, we got to see a little bit more of what makes them tick. And so, yeah, I think partially because the stakes are so high for Deborah in this stage in her career, it lent itself to being emotional and um, in some in some cases more dramatic. But I think that was the thing for us is that we always wanted to make a show that was both heartfelt and hard funny. And we never saw the, the, that to the degree that I hope we get to do because we have a show about comedians who get to deliver jokes. Like Deborah's yeah. love language is joking. She's addicted to telling jokes. She cannot not make a joke about something. Even, you know, DJ, her daughter, after feeling very maligned in that AA meeting or that NA meeting, <laughs> is like, don't make jokes. Like she just can't stop making jokes. So we get to have our cake and eat it too, which is make a show about comedy where we get to tell hard jokes, but then also show the the real life moments that are hard and sad and, you know, real for these characters too. And then season four, like you say, it's like, we're off to the races because while getting that job was a huge challenge for Deborah, launching a late night show and having it be a success is an even bigger challenge. Are you going to be talking about, you know, it's interesting because I know, I'm sure you all do too, people who work on late night shows, nobody's really watching them anymore on television. They're watching them online the next day. You know, the ratings are, I don't want to say infinitesimal, but they're 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 pretty they're not nearly what you would think they would be or, you know, what they were in the day before digital, you know, before mm-hmm. iPhones and and uh, online stuff. Um are you going to be dealing with that or is that too complex. Yeah. But I feel like if you if you want it really at the moment, you, you're going to have to talk about this stuff, will you? And if not, I just gave you a terrific idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, one of the things that we are going to be kind of tackling is the idea of the glass cliff, which is that, um, you know, women oftentimes in business especially um, are kind of offered uh, higher job or, you know, CEO jobs or positions of power, you know, right before kind of the downfall of a company as a, sometimes as a scapegoat, sometimes as a like last resort. Okay, finally, look, fine, let's give it to a woman now that we've kind of already sunk the ship or whatever it is. I, I'm familiar with that phenomenon, Lucia. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so for us, that's definitely something that we'll be tackling. And, and like you said, it is of the moment. And also, you know, I think that's part of why Deborah is given the show, you know, is because so, you know, it's almost impossible to have a successful late night show. But if there's anybody crazy enough to to make something as success, it's Deborah Vance. So Mm. that's definitely part of what season four is about. And I'm so glad, you know, because it's really it's really ridiculous. I just wrote an op ed in The New York Times about how um, there will be no female anchors of evening news broadcasts after Nora wow. O'Donnell steps out, steps down after the election. And, you know, that is a declining industry or declining, you know, um, show and and kind of format for sure. But it still attracts about, gosh, 19 million people a night. Now, granted, Whoa. they're they're all out buying fix it in and depends. But, you know, <laughs> if you look yeah. at the commercials, you're like, whoa. Yeah, but, wow. um, you know, I think it's so important. And it it really it bothers me that still, with the exception of Samantha B, hmm. um, there really haven't been any successful. And of course, Joan Rivers for that moment mm-hmm. in time, mm-hmm. successful late night comedians. And I think it's, um, you know, it shows a real bankruptcy of imagination for programmers and and audiences honestly absolutely yeah i think that's i mean that's very much part of the ethos of the show is about how unfair that is and how um you know in in this world we get to do it 
But, you know, we were asked in an interview, do you think you'll see a female president or a female late night host first? And we said, president. <laughs> it's a yeah. really weird thing that, you know, that it, they haven't been given the chance. And uh, I think that the same goes for for broadcast journalism. It is It is really wild because audiences are also largely, if not equally, female. You know, um, I think women just have a greater... Um, ability to empathize and watch someone in a uh, different gender role than their own. Mm -hmm. And I think there is still like a weird ingrained thing, even in storytelling, even in shows, you know, like in, especially in comedies, there are not a ton of female led comedies. Yes, of course, there have been fantastic ones. And we talked about many of our favorites that were on Nick at Night, but they really don't have the same degree, I don't think, of respect and often instant notoriety that ones that are led by men do. Yeah. Hey, before we go, who thought of the Katie Couric line? I want to give full credit where credit is due. Lucia, was that you, Paul? I don't remember. Jen? So I actually, I think, guys, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that we have to credit our writer's room with that. Yeah, I, I think probably, so. Probably, yeah. I think one of our writers wrote that joke, and and we will find their name. We will, we'll <laughs> we'll know tell their you. names. We'll find out who and <laughs> tell you, and you can send them um, a gift basket or uh, anything I, if you're choosing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send them a Katie Couric media mug. Okay. okay. Love it. Yes. <laughs> yes. And as I told granular, you, and, oh, sorry, go ahead, Lucia. I was going to say, speaking of getting granular, one of the things that we sometimes do is we'll have like a lot, like an area and we'll highlight, the, we'll write a joke and we'll highlight it and send it back to our writers and we'll basically get pages and pages of alts. And we won't know which of our writers wrote which jokes. And then we'll go through them and just pick our favorite one or two, those will be perhaps what will end up in the draft, which is why we're saying we don't actually know it was in that list of um, jokes. But I will say, I don't ever, I didn't think of it as a Palin reference. I just thought that I it was didn't, like a I Deborah. didn't either. You it, didn't? It Deborah, no, I thought it was like just Deborah did a one-on-one -on -one with you and she's talking about her sister and she said, well, you know, she can't read. And, and that just was part of the Even though, for some it, reason. I mean, maybe, the, maybe they thought of it that way, but it's so funny because Lucia and I just rewatched Game Change. Yes. And we were like, man, what a pivotal <laughs> moment in political history. Wasn't I mean, that a good, I thought Jay Roach did such a good job. We are with such that fans show. of Jay Roach. And Danny yes. Strong, yeah. who I think yes. is, I think Danny Strong is so amazingly talented. I thought, yes. um, <clears throat> what was, it? wait, sorry, Michael Keaton, opioid. Dope what sick, was, right? Oh, the dope sick, oh, the, yeah. Yeah, dope sick. I thought dope sick was one of the, best shows i Fantastic. mean depressing as hell but yeah so good and so well written i just think danny strong is a genius yes, um, yes. He is. well adriana i i feel like i kind of picked this conversation as i usually do <laughs> it's fine it's all good you didn't adriana put makeup on for this <laughs> no i didn't okay it. so so among the things <laughs> among the things that contribute to the katie adriana deborah uh. Ava dynamic um one, Katie always picks up my shoes and says, are are these yours or are these John's, her husband's? Because she says I have big feet. Adriana has very big feet. I wear a nine. I wear a nine. Um, but the, I literally put, like, lip balm on before mm -hmm. this. And I was like, wow. I feel I like you look like you have mascara on. I, I don't. Well, you just have very pretty eyelashes then. Thank you. I'm thinking but I was the show I was prepared might for be that. a reality show for you guys. Oh, wow. Because this yeah. dynamic, no, that I don't be know. pretty good. But Adriana, I'll tell you very quickly, and then I'll let you guys go, because you have a million things to do. But Adriana uh, went to Notre Dame, and she wrote her thesis about me. And what was the name of the thesis, oh, wow. Adriana? Katie Couric's career and shifting perceptions of femininity in broadcast journalism. Thank you. Cool. <laughs> and okay. so wow. Adriana was very yeah. smart, because she... Somebody she knew, the mother knew, a producer I had worked with on 60 Minutes. And anyway, Adriana tried every which way to get to me. And I think my friend Deirdre actually is a, was a producer on 60 Minutes. She wrote me and said, you know, this girl is writing her thesis about you. Do you Can you do an interview with her? And, you know, I do get a few requests like that every now and then. <laughs> and I was like... Um, 
Oh, well, that's I was very flattered. Like, wow, the whole thesis about me, that's going to that's going to be hard. But OK. And I remember my assistant at the time was like, you don't want to do this, really, do you? And I was like, <laughs> no, I feel like I should do it. So go ahead, Adriana, pick up the story from there. So then Notre Dame gave me a grant to do research and I flew to New York mm-hmm. and I all of a sudden heard from Katie as I landed at LaGuardia. It was very made for wow. TV. Wait, um, but, but you landed at LaGuardia. Why? So I conveniently used the grant that Notre Dame gave me to book a flight to New York the weekend that Notre Dame had a football game at Yankee Stadium. And then I just was <laughs> hoping that the Great. time timing would work out. And it did. Smart. And then Katie oh. invited Yeah. Then Katie invited me over to her apartment to interview her. And I was in hungover slightly, incredibly nervous, <laughs> and like sweating through my like blouse that my professor like made me wear oh Um, my god yeah and she was so cute and then she was graduating and I and I was writing oh you know she was so funny like I can't even describe how how funny Adriana was interviewing me like well and she gets so embarrassed whenever (laughs) I I can't even think about (laughs) that moment she like just is so mortified but then I was writing a book and she was graduating and I was like hey Adriana, you're you know but more about me than I do, having written this thesis. Do you want to come and help me write my book? And she did. And then the pandemic happened. She ended up living with us for like over a year. Oh my gosh. And oh with my, my daughter God. and with my daughter Carrie. I have a second daughter who lives here in New York. And um, so anyway, Adriana knows me probably better than almost anyone including my husband. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay, this is a show. This is a show. It is, it's, it's a show. show. It's a show. Wow, you guys live together. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because Ooh, Adrian wow. is from Palm Springs, and I think mm. oh, we are working cool. on the book, and... Well, also the you know, pandemic well, hit. Well, she came we were... for like two weeks, and it ended up being for more than a year. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. She had to make yeah. many trips to J. Crew. Yeah. Hilarious. <laughs> I did. Probably helpful to borrow the husband's shoes. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But anyway, well, listen, thank you all so much. We're, as, as you know, we've already said, we're such fans of yours, such fans of the show. And I feel like, you know, as somebody who's dot who's uh, the mother of a writer, I feel like writers don't get enough credit because without them, these shows just wouldn't be anything. I mean, obviously, the actors bring it to life, but the writing is so good and the stories and the characters are so, I think, beautifully drawn that um, we were just very excited to spend a little time with you. So thank you all so much. Thanks for having thank us. You. Thank this you for so having fun. us. It's a and good dream luck with true. Se- good luck for se- with season four. I told you I'm thank available you. if you need any cameo. Be careful. Be, Be careful. careful. Wish for Katie. <laughs> think careful. about it. Think about it. If you need, like, I don't know, some sexy hot journalist. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, are you trying to anything else before we go? Uh, the one thing I was going to let you guys know is we solicited questions from Katie's audience ahead of this. And uh, my favorite comment, not question, was I use SPF 50 on my hands now because of Deborah Vance. Love okay, it. Okay, changing Love the world that. one That's hand good. at a time. Okay. One Making hand a at a time. Like, yeah. <laughs> one one liver spot at a time. <laughs> yeah. Because as she says, you can't get a hand job. Yeah, yeah. there's yeah. no such thing. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm bumped. <laughs> <laughs> thanks everybody thank and you thanks so to your team for letting you spend so much time with us of course thank you our pleasure okay. our pleasure take care bye, bye. Take see care. you soon we hope